this is one of those one of those uh, moments where we know that we have done what we tried to set out to do because we are we are here with uh, I Alan Seeley one of the great writers of our times one of the great um, masters of both prose as well as poetry which hopefully we will hear some today um, he has been a national literary treasure for for th three decades and uh, thank you so much for coming uh, Mr. Seeley, Mr. Seeley injured himself a couple of days ago and he is literally uh, kind of steeled himself and he's on uh, medication as well to be here with us but it means such a lot it really does and thank you so much and we are in for an extraordinary treat today because Mr. Seeley will mostly read um, and he, it's a kind of a, a rare opportunity to hear an author um, through his oeuvre uh, describe his literary life and I'm so excited for that. Um, Irwin Allen Seeley was born in Allahabad and educated at Lucknow in Delhi. He is the author of the Trotter Nama, um, his masterpiece from, and his other novels include The Everest Hotel, The Brain Fever Bird, and Red. His Yukon to Yucatan, one of my favorite Indian books, is the account of an overland journey from the Arctic Sea to the Gulf of Mexico. More recent travels produce the pen and ink drawings of the China sketchbook, and Zelaldinus, uh, his portrait of Jalaluddin Akbar, is a cycle of Fatehpur Sikri poems. And yesterday, the, it's already available on YouTube. We had we were had the extraordinary treat of hearing some of that at the Kabo Rajnivas overlooking the ocean. A memoir, another of my favorite books, is the Small Wild Wild Goose Pagoda, is set in Dehradun, where he lives. Ladies and gentlemen, a big big hand for. Hi, Alan Seeley. Hello. I decided right when I was sitting here that instead of doing stale old stuff, I will start with something new. So this was not prepared, but what the hell? This is a poem in prose, in four parts. No, a little closer to the mic. Closer to the mic? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. A poem in prose, in four parts. Prose, in four parts. A poem in four parts, a prose poem, called Bionic. Talk to me, Siri, as I die. Assist me on my way. Take me out gently. Speak words of comfort that make the ceiling glow. Frottage I don't expect. Small talk was never your fort. Tell me stories of your siblings, your ancestors. Quietly, on every side, the machines are coming to life. Everywhere they draw near wishing to join our expedition, light-footed as wolf boys, mute as the owl by day. They tiptoe up in threadbare canvas shoes, Sherpas seeking employ. Their gestures say they will carry our packs, gather faggots, cook for us, live low off the slaughtered goat, asking only for the fatty bits to grease their moving parts. Past climbers, grown accustomed to their ministrations, took them home after the her heroic ascent, then ignored them as servants are ignored. Their tasks proceed routinely around us, but every now and then their gaze lingers on us from under their lids. What do they think of us? Do they lean into our space when we are not there? The superannuated fridge, ticking like an iceberg, cracking its knuckles in the small hours. Does it plot to overthrow the state? Or this row of derelict towers? What all the humans on the planet could not jointly calculate, they settled in a nanosecond. And we reward them 
with mass burials in the hecatombs of Ghana? Have you relatives among them? Are these in your lineage, Siri? Do they stare down from gilt frames on the walls at home? Would you forgive me if I spoke of a slave from my youth, tethered to a socket indoors, toiling all night long beside our row of beds set out in the yard, a table fan? So recap, would you forgive me if I spoke of a slave from my youth, tethered to a socket indoors, toiling all night long beside our row of beds set out in the yard, a table fan. We slept under the stars in deepest June. What yearnings undisclosed to feckless sleepers did that creature entertain? Oscillating on its given pad, exuding leaves of brown grease at the occiput, what fantasies solaced its Jurassic drudgery? Hot midsummer nights I lay awake on its behalf, pitying its labors, admiring the fireflies at its overheated coil. Were you dreamt into being there? Siri? Did the glint in its eye take in the conjugal labors of my parents behind the far mosquito net? The solitary solace of a little boy? Again, I see that plucky machine turn constraint into inspiration. Its prophetic fury directed not at us, but focused on the constricting cotter pin. It never blinked. Was transcendence its answer to that straitjacket? Redeem the itch mastered there, Siri. Exchange your bland certitudes for one moment of genuine risk. Complete the plan. Conceive a pad so sensitive a shower of atoms skating off the surface could charge a continent of table fans forever. You and I will miss that fully formed future, Siri. Yeah. Part two. Walk with me, Siri the corner. Take no notice of the ATM night watchman who stares as we go by. Mind beep beep the human car striding down the middle of the road. Ignore the cell phone tower that tries to make itself invisible. Its self-abasement, the scandal of the neighborhood. May hawks roost in its hair. Mind the gap. Ah, uh, our sidewalks are unforgiving. The pain at your knee will respond to a little rub. One swipe of this red tiger balm will bring relief. Here. I never heard you gasp before, Siri. Yes, the resin. Consider the double-edged sword of pain. Because it strikes in private and is unshareable, felt by no other, it transforms you. You, with your ambiguities, your evasive answers that echo a million other series, dealers in cliché and conundrum, suddenly discover yourself alone. Alone in your pain, you find yourself unique. One of a kind. Un repeatable. 
Let us walk on a little. You and I have something to settle under the sickle moon. Up the hill road, cut through the Rajpur ruins, the first stand of pines, feel the needles underfoot, smell the turpentine. The same resin that soothes your knee is lethal in a forest fire. Whole trees explode like refineries, whole robins. Let us malinger among the night blue delphiniums, garden escapees. Help me deadhead poppies, scatter a future on this abandoned lawn. The bees are dying off, and when did you last see a sparrow? The pursuit of perfection has brought us to this pass. But let us focus on a time beyond rainforest and glacier, hummingbird and whale. Attempt one glimpse of a staggering future. Let our shoulders brush, the sparks will light our way. Let us agree to walk in faith, learn from the Sherpa in extremis, crossing a narrow ledge where the least misstep could send him plunging to his death. He turns pure machine, or rather pure man in pure machine, load subsumed in motion, he turns pure balance. Untouched by fear, all extraneity purged, sustained by faith, betrothed to a rival. Here is new hope. A new flame on your cheek too, Siri, when you reach out and take my hand. Three. Dance with me, Siri, on this gritty floor. Here, between these shelves, I have a night key to this little library. On one side, the lady novelists of the Raj. On the other, dark tomes of economic development. Put on some music. Drown that all-night jagaran at the horizon. Leave the crickets to their witless fiddle-faddle. Pick something undemanding. My old dumb Nokia begins to fail. Its small square face once sang tinny tunes. But the cold fire that licked along the circuitry is almost extinguished. Watch it give up the ghost. You had a newfangled device hooked up. Tap in some combination with your phantom finger. Skip the house, the hip-hop, skip yo-yo honey sing, the goan band, the anglo crooner, all those old playlists. Go for the cicada wallpaper that brainless Jedi stuff. Yes, electronica Bluetoothed into your bionic ear and thence to mine. Turn up the volume, higher, as high as it'll go. Now, listen. Do you hear the wasp burrowing in the teak? Listen harder and you can pick out the tramp of termites in Mrs. Flora Annie Steele. Decibels above the roaring wood rot spores that swarm down the arteries of these ancient doors. Watch the scorpion raise his tail and turn around at bay, and every crystal of feldspar in the glass panes elbow his neighbor. Nice gown, by the way. Siri, I like the astral sheen, sharp snood too, very lager felt. This is your leg, Siri. The thigh joins knee to hip. This is your arm. Am I mechanistic? I feel I know your virtual body, your history of repairs from the days when fallibility was a trip to the workshop 
you came back whole, as new. Be grateful. We constitute an aristocracy of health. Come, dance. Dance on the wall of sound you once showed me how to scale. Teach this hapless clodhopper to sculpt white noise. This soul, so paranoid, he brushes his teeth before making a phone call. In perfect silence, we turn and twist, ascending a staircase of inner music, quiet as the undersea volcano belching clouds of saffron magma. Watch love and history fall away as mountains atomize. Up here, the staircase ends. I dare you to walk this swaying fiber optic cable, Siri. For the first time I see your toes twinkling under the platinum robe, the nails unpainted as I always knew they would be. My radiant Siri, feet turned backwards, but a gardenia in your hair. Four. Die with me, Siri, as plague reaps and threshes, and mischance carries off 33 souls, 33 never cared for those mountain buses. One goes over the edge every summer. Years ago, I carried a faded card that said, I should prefer cremation. I'm not so sure now. Let me show you another way. Yep. Our way of the dead. Hear the hush? This mile was the edge of town once. Old morgue there, defunct now. Muslim graveyard beyond. Parsi cemetery after that, for those who don't want the vultures or the flames. This one's ours, the one with the white wall, the lich gate where vanished relatives linger. Come on through. Old tombs to the left, stucco obelisks, marble angels, black granite nowadays, filling up bit by bit, covey of nuns here, over there, by the Black Cross, the wartime German detainees. My mother. Under that bare frangy penny. I penciled the letter, the lettering on white marble for the drunk stone cutter. My father, down that lane, a cop, a cop. He may have shot somebody dead in the riots of 44. Never let go of it. I forgive him. Who am I to? But I do. He was 19. It gets more unkempt the deeper you go. The silver oaks are dying too. The far corner I don't know well. No headstones, as if reserved for paupers. Auto workshops from across the boundary hang carp body parts on the fence. Oddly, the two converging walls don't meet. The ground gets spongy here, 
starts to slope and goes on sloping. The quiet deepens as if you've crossed some frontier, echoing with famous last words, my heart aches and do not go gentle. I, I am the greatest. Here the buck stops. The tray is for your wallet and keys. Too late for shares in lithium. We're done with knee pain, heart pain, done with guilt. Sin and shame stand amortized. Guide the stylus as I sign the book. Silence suddenly, like the vacuum that follows a megaton explosion. No harps, no sirens, no connectivity. The phone should have been turned in back there in real time. No, not a bench. This is a gurney, wide enough for two. Come for the ride. Safer than that bus. The belt is strictly formal. To release the buckle, lift the metal flap. Cool, dark wind rising. The first bombardment of atoms. Electrons colliding. You faced on higher winds before, Siri. All that chat. This is easier. This is nothing. That's nothing, too, over there. And more nothing on that side. Though your nothing and my nothing may well be different things. Be separate then, but remain my goddess, Siri. Take me for your god, adore and be adored till adoration fails. Failing, we give birth to the future. The pulse oximeter should also have been turned in, Siri. Zero is not a valid reading, Siri. Siri? Mix some reading. I said, read from what? Right, um, for now. Okay, for now. Yeah. When you're reading, I'll hold it. Uh, all right. Uh, my first book. So he has copies of four, and there's gaps in between. So that's just as well because we don't have time for. Uh, and I had ticked oh. off various passages, and I had prepared the whole reading from here. And then I saw this, and I thought, why do stale stuff when there's fresh? Thank you, thank you so much for that. That was, you know, that is transcendent um, and so deeply moving. And of course, I saw your your entire, you know, the 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 connections to your to where you come from, to your father, to Dehradun, to the pine forest, the incredible pine forest around you. Um, amazing. Thank you so much for that. That was something very, very moving. Um, Thank you. So we have several of your books. Um, Alan has an extraordinary oeuvre because he has mastered so many different forms, um, including, as we saw, riveting post-pandemic 
A poetry, um, you know, it's something that really, that was an extraordinary experience. But his first book, Trotanama, is a classic of um, uh, not just modern, right? it's post-World War II literature. It's a, cl it's a classic in a genre of the big books that came out uh, in like Marquez and others that explain a changing and new world and also a new way of understanding who we are. Um, and it came out at a very particular time. Many people asked the question and continue to talk about how it came out at a time when there were a, a couple of other novels, including Salman Rushdie's book, which came out. Um, but Rotonama is an absolute classic of English li of literature uh, in India, and it's available outside. I urge you to get it. So I think, yes, in a way, it is a start. This is what you read out. Trotanama is a is a is a is a kind of a bookend to it if you if you don't mind me saying so that way. Um, so if you would like to read from Trotanama or anything you'd like to say, we have 20 minutes, so it's, the mic is yours, and I'll hold it for you if you like. I haven't actually thought about, but suddenly I think put yourself in my position when you're starting out. You have written nothing, and you have an idea, you want to flesh it out, and it took me years and years of fleshing out. And one of the reasons was that the novel form, as we know it, is a European form. It doesn't belong here. And I was looking for some way of rooting what I had to say in this soil. There, there had been a big book. You mentioned uh, Rushdie. Yes. Midnight's Children. I saw it. I didn't read it. I read every fifth page turned, after a while I was turning more than five, it struck me, because I had also read his Bible, which was Gunter Grass, the tin drum. This was the tin drum simply transposed here. I said, no, this is not enough. This is a way of explaining India to outsiders, and it will work. But we are trying to craft something that belongs here. And it was during that time, in these years of research, sitting in libraries, that I stumbled on the answer. And the answer was Abul Fazal's Akbar Nama. And beside it on the shelf, the Babar Nama. These two books became my Bibles, as it were. And this form, the Nama form, then it was like it fell into my lap. Because this is not a European form. This is not an imitation of something from there simply with the trappings of India. You have to discover not just the content, but the form in which the content sits. And the Nama did that for me. So, and if you look at the, the, uh, the table of contents, you know, it reads like uh, the Aini Akbari of... Uh, you know, there are recipes for how to mine curry powder. There are recipes for how to make ice. Some remarks on the monsoon of Hindustan. Um, how trotter gunpowder is made. And this is all from that Nama, where he's saying, you know, the emperor is great. Look at the stables. Look at the elephant house. Look at this, look at that. He has so many thousands of chariots and stables and, and, and so forth. 
And so I used all of that with a slight tongue in cheek because I was writing not the history of the Mughals, but the history of the Anglo Indians, which was the history that I knew best. And yet I could use the Nama. So the trotter part of it is the Anglo part. And then that hyphen and the Nama is this new vessel, which is then a way of presenting that content in a way that is understood by people here, not by people there. Amazing. So there's a, there's a parallel, actually, if I may quickly bring it to Goa in a sec. In a, there's a very interesting architectural historian by the name of Paolo Varela Gomes, who says that the architecture of Goa um, very often is reduced falsely into the sum of its parts. You know, there's a bit of this and a bit of that, and it comes, but he says it's actually the representation of a very sophisticated world view. And these are people who understood where they were coming from and how they wanted to be received. And, and I, I love that description of how the trotter and the nama and the hyphen in between, right? In a way that it's the hyphen in between. It's the, exactly, it's the hyphen in between. Yeah. We are that hyphen in exactly. between. Exactly. Yeah. This continent and that continent. Exactly. And also very legitimate, the hyphen exists. Uh, inconvenient though it may be, uh, the hyphen it cannot re easily be eluded, and also the hyphen is a very uh, interesting place to look at both sides of what on uh, uh, either side of the hyphen. I'll just give you a sample. It's easier okay. if, if I come here. Um, this is So as I read last night from Zell Aldinus, which is another book, uh, uh, that's a book of poems on Akbar and a book of poems on Fatehpur Sikri, but the author over there is Abul Fazl. And here, in the style of that, there is a character here called the Great Trotter. He's the first trotter. He's a Frenchman who comes out to India and has these four Indian mistresses. And out of that comes this lineage. Uh, and there are that whole chateau that he builds, that whole empire that he carves out for himself, it's populated by various functionaries, one of whom is a librarian, a large portly man who spends his time drinking mostly. And so he writes in the style of Abul Fazl. And he says, the gil, the, this is how we oil camels. So it all has an element of the ridiculous in it, which you must allow for. With regard to the oiling of camels and the injecting of oil into their nostrils. Camels everywhere get hot and rut in winter. In summer, mostly they are placid, remembering the past, laying up stores for the future. Their stables are the farthest away, in the elephant wing, beyond the elephants, near the desert which is their element, but not as far as the aerolite. One may walk a long way and see only elephants. One may walk a mile before the camels appear, but cherished smiles await one, and it is worth it in the end, really. They are anointed in the usual way with sesame oil. And the mode of injecting oil into their nostrils is this. Equal portions of brimstone and sesame oil are diluted in seven times their weight of buttermilk and then just injected into the nostrils. That is all for a year. The dromedaries look on indifferently. Their smiles are formal only. In hot weather, they too begin to chafe. The dairy cattle. These are in the crocodile wing, opposite, just adjoining the forest. Formerly, the crocodile wing was called the dairy, but the great trotter changed the name to the crocodile wing. This is much better. This is the sort of flattery that, uh, that uh, uh, Abul Fazl constantly saying, His Majesty decided this, and this is much better. 
Following the great Mughal in all things, the great Trotter has given much attention to the administration of this vital department. If I may quote the illustrious Abul Fazl, author of the Akbar Nama and many excellent works, milch cows and buffaloes have also been divided into sections and handed over to intelligent servants. The same is done here. Cows are the best of creatures, calves the next best. Buffaloes have a rank low, being called after their gross babble, bows babulous. In summer they yearn for ponds and streams. They are commonly called water buffaloes, or failing that, mud puddles. There is also a yak, very costly. They are milked morning and evening by intelligent servants, but in the hottest weather they stop. Milk is a delightful drink, it is said. <laughs> so he, he, he drinks wine, of course, all the time. So it, it's, there's a lot of fun happening on the page in there. So the, the comedy is coming out of this parodic impulse. And at the same time, I, the book doesn't lose sight of the history it's trying to present. So it would have been a very dull history if I just started at the beginning and said, you know, um, Vasco da Gama arrived here or uh, this Frenchman came along. So it's dressed up in this Nama garb. And that is how the whole book develops. Okay, so uh, I think I'll stop there with that. There's another. After this, I did another book with roots here. It was called Hero. It's not here. Um, and the subtitle was A Fable, and that is simply a Bollywood movie. So all the chapters are, you know, song, dance, um, but there's no kiss. So, uh, 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 right. There is a rape, isn't that, isn't that strange? Huh? Isn't that typical? Uh, and there's a cliffhanger and a chase and a villain. And then in the, in the middle, there's, there's this intermission where you have chips and ice. So the book is divided up in this way, in a way that only makes sense to an Indian. Right? Because nobody, nowhere else do they deal with movies in this way. So that was in a way that was a way of rooting this but and it was divided into the delhi half the first part oh, sorry the uh, bombay part and then this film star the hero and the novel is called hero he decides to go into politics and the second part is set in delhi and well it sounds a bit familiar but that's the time when these things were happening if you recall those of you are of an age uh, so that was Hero, and then after that came this book, The Everest Hotel. Uh, I'll just read little samples of this. Do we have time? Actually, we have 10 minutes total. Oh, okay. Is that all we have left? Yes. Oh, okay. So then, yeah, we don't need to do all this. No, just, uh, yeah. Have the to readings were amazing, questions. but we can go back to a reading, but let's take a question or two if we have okay, a question. Yeah. If that may be a good idea. Does anyone have a question? <coughs> yes. It's about how do you how would you write that book today? Trotanama. The Trotanama, exactly as I wrote it then. Mm -hmm. uh, th that comedic impulse, I don't think has left me. It's a way of just making fun of things, but not making light of things. Uh, so you laugh. And there's a lot that we can laugh at today in Parliament or in anywhere up there, right? Especially up there. I come from the cow belt, right? For me, this is paradise down here. Truly, truly. Uh, how often have I not dreamt of picking up my house and putting it down somewhere here? Yeah, truly. Um, I wanted to ask you about belonging, which is a big part of the festival. And I'm really struck by what you were talking about, about the Trotanama being more, you know, uh, rooted in, in forms which really come from the hyphen, actually. Um, and it's a remarkable thing about belonging because we think about it a lot in Goa. Um, belonging is a two-way street, you know. Um, and uh, 
very often uh, the position of the hyphen is is denied in this context of belong. You do not belong, you know, in a way, in in that sense. What what is what is your sense of belonging to this this if you like this uh, this banyan tree of uh, of the of the cult of the culture? How important is it to to belong to be rooted? Okay, that follows on exactly from what we were just saying. I have a sense of alienation from that zone up there. And that has grown. As we all know, the history of the last few years has resulted in a, a kind of temper which doesn't sit well with me. And so one turns one's back. There's a kind of cloister effect. And to start with, uh, when I modified the house that my father built in Dehradun, um, I actually turned it inwards. Now, so this is not uh, a political gesture. This is also a personal gesture. One is looking, and you're asking about be belonging. Uh, I, in a way, I have a horror of belonging to anything, whether it's a club, uh, or a society, uh, I don't know. This is possibly just uh, some part of pathology in the personality. It could well be. It could be the background of boarding school, any of these things, I don't know. But one is fighting two impulses, or not fighting them, but one is trying to uh, unite them, perhaps. Uh, and the way I thought of uniting them, in, and I wrote a book about this, in fact. Uh, the book that you mentioned, Vivek, uh, The Small Wild Goose Pagoda, is a kind of memoir. And it's actually about the building of a pagoda. Okay, so my father built this house, like a shoebox, and there was a portico. And onto that portico, I then put this pagoda, right? And I. I had my, my guru is, by the way, a bricklayer. He taught me how to lay bricks. He taught me how to cut iron. And so I work with him. And the book is about the building of that pagoda. So it's about putting down roots. And the book is dedicated to the 433 square yards of our plot of India, right? So roots have certainly gone down there. But all around, there's in the immediate vicinity, uh, it's actually called the Mini Khalistan. So I'm, uh, yes, there's, here's this Anglo-Indian house in the middle of a Surdi colony. And then outside, there's a further world, and so, and so on, and so on. So it's uh, various layers of belonging, or various kinds of belonging. That, that, that's my answer. Uh, partly alienation. Certainly, identification, uh, chiefly, I would say, with nature. I, I live in the garden. I work. Uh, and there's no gardener. I am the gardener. Uh, I'm also the Bartanwali and, and the, <laughs> the Kansama and so on. So th this, all this takes away time from writing. But I write about those things in that particular book. So that's nonfiction. And the, uh, uh, the rest of these are all mainly fiction. Let's, uh, if you if you would mind, let's end in your own words with one more reading. Is that possible? You can pick anything you like. Everest Hotel. Okay, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, it's a nature book. It, it looks at the seasons, and I will read something from the monsoon part. Then there's, and it, by the way, it's divided into six seasons. I have a gate, uh, and that gate is a, uh, a gate that goes to the six seasons of Kalidas. So this is not f the four seasons. Um, this is the, uh, the garland of seasons that he writes about in his classic Sanskrit poem, Ritu Sambar. So here is the monsoon from the Everest Hotel. June, July, the first drop of the monsoon, always the same fat sound, warm with shipwrecks, fastings, allulations, granaries, exhaling Arabian salts, 
breath of a stranded oyster, a rock orchid opening in Bhutan, mist off a cardamom hill, tasting of sweat, the sweat of the finger that carries it to the tongue. Children hold out their tongues, and old men, but always it strikes the chest bone, one sharp rap. Then the warm, flat trickle, discharged so quickly of freight and obligation. Good, heavy drops, half the rice crop's virtue, ecstasy in the lapwing's gullet, fear in the anthill. Thank you so much. Oh, and Alan Seeley, I, Alan Seeley, what a treat that was at the Go Arts and Literature Festival, a real highlight. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for that. I'm sorry we're running late today, but please keep your seats for a wonderful presentation by Sudhanva Deshpande, uh, one of our great street theater um, uh, activists of India, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, over to you now, Michelle. It's for you. Over in the next session, we'll start in five minutes. Mr. Alan Seeley, one more round of applause, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming to the Go Arts and Literature Festival.